when you decide you're going to be best in the world at something, you can't just be for that, end up being on that one product because it pervades throughout the whole business. So your logistics have to be best, your manufacturing has to be best, your delivery has to be, marketing has to be best in order to not let any competition slightly move into that market. So last but far from least, we have our third interview. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Chip Wilson, Blue Lemon. Chip, it's so great to have you. You've had a, a wild journey, a beautiful journey, a challenging journey like any great entrepreneur. I understood you worked in the oil fields in your 20s. Yeah. And then at 25, you started your first company. And if I understand it correctly, that was originally oriented towards uh, what was happening in the surf community, correct? Tell us a little bit about that journey with your first company, if you would. Yeah, so I, I actually started in triathlon clothing. Okay. Um, you know, I was, I was a big guy. I mean, not as big as you, but, you know, yeah. I was, uh, and, I, uh, and almost all clothing had seams on the inside that would, you know, like we're open. And so, especially in salt water, the rashing, and, and I just couldn't, nothing fit me. And, you know, you were in the, probably yeah. in the same situation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my mom's a sewer. My dad's a phys ed teacher. I think genetically I came through it all. And um, so got in the surf business. And that's what I learned really is that there's this seven-year arc, you know, between something starting off at nothing. Yes. Becoming like going from three companies to 500 companies, the mergers and acquisitions, yes. and then... Um, too much competition, dumping a product, and then there's three companies left. Mm. And so I saw that happen in skateboard, and I saw it happen in surfing, so I got to know when the right time was to get in and right time to get out. And then snowboarding, right? It wasn't that the last version of that company in Westbrook? Was it snow was snowboarding? Oh, snowboarding, yeah. Well, that, was, that was the last part of it, yeah. And you started anticipating in each of those cases. So you built that business over 17 years, and if I understood correctly, sold it for $15 million. You were, what, 42 years old at that point? Yeah, so years? it worked out to about $6 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's most, that's most entrepreneurs. If you break us down to our hourly wage, it, it humbles us, doesn't it? Well, when you pay banks off and private private equity and partners, they, yes. yeah, that's yes, I, I get it. So, but at that point, you had a certain level of cash and you'd sold your business. So one question is, why'd you sell it at that time? And then the second question is, I understand that year, you read a hundred of the best uh, business and personal development books out there and came up with a philosophy of giving without an expectation of return. So tell us first, why'd you sell the business? And tell us about your journey before you built Lululemon and how it affected you in building it. Well... Why did I sell the business? One, I did 18 years of really not making any money. I mean, we got one big hit at the end, and otherwise it was poverty all the way through. Yeah. So, um, but the, By the way, I want to interrupt. I hope everybody hears that. Remember Airbnb? Remember Joe talking about eight years, nothing. <laughs> and then eight years later, 50 billion. Right? You know, it takes time, right? But right. Go ahead. And 30% of the snowboard business was in Japan. And the... If everyone, nobody remembers this. I, you know, this is like me coming to you and telling you <laughs> what to say. But, uh, you know, the Japanese in, in the middle 90s were buying up the whole world. I mean, the, the yen was very high. And then, uh, uh, you know, that whole economy started to collapse. And uh, this whole, you know, Japanese are very, very um, brand-driven and, and image-driven. And they just decided that snowboarding was finished. And I could kind of see that through the through the trees, so I said, this is a good time to sell. Okay, that makes sense. And tell me about that year before you built Lululemon. I, you read all these books. Yeah. Tell me what your intention was, and tell me what you pulled from that, and how it shaped your building a business going forward and yeah, your life. Yeah, I mean, I sold it to a public company in Salem, Oregon, so I traveled from Vancouver to back to, to Vancouver. My two boys were in Vancouver, and so I had six hours there and six hours back twice a week. <clears throat> and... I know from the 100 books that I read when I was 18 years old living on the Alaska oil pipeline that that was a, I had something nobody else in the world had. I had all this knowledge and a whole bunch of money at the age of 18. And so when I sold uh, Lou Lemon, I had some money. I knew I had to reinvent myself. Yes. And um, I'd been through a lot of uh, personal development and looking at all these things, but I went, 
it was just kind of the type where you could put an audio tape in and start to listen to books. And yeah. I listened to a hundred of them, and probably out of that hundred, I probably probably three of them came to the top. Seemed to encompass what every all the other three did. And it was uh, Good to Great by Collins. Yes. It was uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yep. And it was The Psychology of Achievement by uh, Brian Tracy. Yep. Really goal setting there was the key yeah. part of that. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, you, you mentioned one, so that triggers me. I think I read you said, all it really takes is a clear vision and execution. And, but most people don't execute. <laughs> Obviously, they have lots of vision, lots yeah. of talk. I think it's genetic. I, you know, when I look around, I'm very, very thankful that there's, you know, I have financial people that don't want to risk. They don't want to go into their own business. They want to work. They want to do their job. They want to, it, it, it's, it's just, a, it's just, I think risk inherently is a genetic makeup like mm. any, anything else. Yeah. We've actually talked about that here, talking about not everybody's made to be an entrepreneur. It's not a negative, it's just if it's against your nature, right. taking risk. And, and these days in our culture, if people have been so conditioned to even be afraid to be near a human breathing on them for risk. You think about what our founders of this country would think about to modern Americans, it's a little crazy. Tell me, um, so you, and I think when you were 32, you were diagnosed with a form of muscular dystrophy. Right, right. Yes. How did you deal with that? And then as I understand it, you found yoga when you were 43, 42, <laughs> and then it became, that was the trigger for Lululemon. You were trying to take care of your back pain. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Right. So it's a little bit of a journey. I mean, I was, I'd say, quite a good competitive swimmer. But when it came to actually surf and skateboarding, I wasn't that good, and I really didn't understand why. And I just didn't have a sense of balance. I'm missing a whole bunch of like little muscles here and there type mm. of thing. So, yes, I was diagnosed. Uh, I, I, I went, oh, my back's really bad, but part of it is the muscular dystrophy again. So they went, okay, well, there's nothing you can do about it. You've got this disease. But at, um, Why did you not let that stop you? Why did you not let that depress you? Most people would turn that into a story about my life's uh, over, and you didn't. Well, I, quite honestly, I think it's, it's like you ignore it. Mm. You know, like I, I was a pretty powerful guy at the time, and okay, I diagnosed it, but Jesus, I mean, I just finished an Ironman two months ago. I'm, I feel okay. Yeah. You know, so, uh, um, so, but as I got to be 43 and I'd gone through and I'd fallen so much in skateboarding and surf and um, skateboarding that, you know, there was a real problem. So, um, I started doing yoga. So, and, you know, I found that little tab on the side of the telephone post and went to the first class that was ever in, uh, in Vancouver. And it was me and six girls. And, um, and you were hooked for life. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, after, after a life of dealing with and being with 14- to 18-year-old boys in the surf to skate industry, I have to tell you that it was, it was quite a breath of fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> So you, it really helped you, yoga did, but, but you, it was more than that, wasn't it? You saw this as a social, physical movement. You saw this as something that could take off like snowboarding or like uh, you know, surfing. Is that true? Right. The, I saw the same thing. The, the, the amount of growth in that 30 days was even more than surf, skate, snowboarding. And, of course, the market could, is infinitely bigger. And, and um, you know, we were, I was always out to... Uh, make components for people to live a longer, healthier, and more fun life. That was my vision, mission yes. in life. So um, I looked at this and I went, I'm out of the surf, skate, snowboarding industry, and it was really hard for me to bring self-development and leadership into that because 14 to 18-year-old boys aren't into that this time. But this new market of what I saw as a 32-year-old single professional woman who owned her own condo, who traveled, who was stylish and physically active was a massive market. And it had never existed before because up until that time, women got married at 23 and had children. And suddenly, they, there was a gap of 23 to probably 35 of a, you know, a, a group of women that were, I mean, you, you maybe you fell into that, but who were uh, a lot of disposable income and, and fanatic. And they were open to self-development where men weren't actually at the time. Yeah. That's interesting. And you're, as you saw that pattern, you also saw the opportunity in terms of the clothing side of it. What, what did you see that other people didn't see at that time? Well, I think through surf, skate, snowboarding, there was a technical reason for all the, that clothing, or maybe not skateboarding as much, but 
you know, definitely surf, you needed like stretch shorts, you needed a higher rise on the back because you're squatting and lower front because you're bending over, you know, smaller waist to bigger thighs. There was a real technical part to that, which I took into snowboarding too. And of course, on snowboarding, you've got top of the mountain, it's life or death at the top of a mountain, and especially in Whistler. And then um, when, I, when I started to look at yoga clothing, well, there was nothing there. It was it really at the time, and this is 1998 now, 1997, it was a badge of honor to wear your worst clothing to the gym. <laughs> and, 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 and there weren't that many women in the gym, quite frankly. And, you know, women kind of spent more, t- more time looking at the at the um, studio classes where men were more in the weight room. But I could, I could sense that in yoga that this was terrible clothing, especially for stretch and movement and sweating. And so I, from snowboarding, I had the perfect first layer piece of fabric and clothing and I redeveloped that for yoga. So what was the innovation in that area? Was it like dry, the moisture taking away from the body or was it it's design a, or was it? A couple things, one, uh, Dan Skin made made uh, tights at the time, but they were, I mean, there were only a few angstroms thick, and it was very, very see-through, very transparent, and looked like a light bulb on your butt. And if you can remember uh, Jane Fonda, she, you know, they, she wore tights, but then wore a, a, a leotard over top, because, I mean, they, the fact of the matter is that seam just went right through the middle of the crotch, and it, be, it was unusable outside of the studio, especially if women went out studio and went out into, into the world. So I knew from Surfskate snowboarding that it wasn't just the technical fabric, but where those businesses really made a lot was taking that look, that feel, and wearing it out on the street, mm. which is why you ended up with all the tech guys in, in uh, San Jose wearing the hoodies and the, you know that type yeah. of thing is that kind yeah. of feeling. So I knew that that's where the big money was and that's where the big growth was. And, and you've, uh, did you uh, uh, come across or did you create the term, you know, what they call it, athletic leisure or leisure athletic? What was, no, did I, that already exist? Or I'm curious. Well, I had developed that name in um, at West Beach probably in the 80s, but I called it street technical and I called it streck. It, it didn't, nobody, nobody, it didn't catch on. Yeah. It wasn't that phonetically great a name. And I tried a couple other names, but it never uh-huh. really worked. And, uh, I mean, if you're out on the West Coast, the whole, what I'd call the athletic way of dressing athletic all day long existed 20 years before it did on the East Coast. And when the Vogue magazine finally caught on to it, you know, as a trend, yes. they called it athleisure. And, you know, to me, that's a, you know, a 45-year-old, you know, woman in New Jersey in a mall with, <laughs> you know, pink leotards on, you know, or something, you know. I, it, 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 it didn't relate to the, what I'd call West Coast way of dressing was. Are you, uh, one of the things we teach people here is at a fundamental basic level is that if you want to grow your business, the first thing is discover who is your ideal client, not your current client. Right. And then fall in love with them, understand everything they love, they hate, they excite, what their problems are, what their challenges. Don't fall in love with your product. Fall in love with your client. And then come up with an irresistible offer and then over-deliver as a fundamental way of growing business. I know from the very beginning, you mentioned it. I forgot her name. You had a name for this 32-year-old woman, Ocean. (laughs) Tell us, uh, she hasn't aged in all these years that you worked on (laughs) Lululemon. Tell us a little bit about how you were so clear about who the ideal client was and how that kind of shaped the way in which you approached the marketing and the growth of the business. I just got to do a a shout-out to my wife, who's the original, one of our original designers. I heard that. I heard she was the original designers. Give it up for her. Yeah, yeah. Well I, well, I see it happen in every company. Uh, even the companies I'm involved with now, I go in there and go, who's your target customer? Somewhere between a 23 and 49, you know, like <laughs> kind of makes this kind of, I have no idea. And I was like super, super clear. And I think this is one of the great successes of Lou Lemon. It was exactly that 32-year-old single professional woman who was just about to get married you know, just about to have children, highly disposable money, when very fashionable, athletic. Mm. So, and, and that. And really, what did she want? What was her desire well, that you were fulfilling? Well, I think she. I well, on the West Coast for sure. She wanted. She. T- the number one thing that was the most important to her was time. Mm. So, for a for a woman to be able to um, get up in the morning and and take her kids to school, then hit the gym or the studio 
then go to coffee, then go shopping, and then get home without having to stink, without having to change your clothing, and still looking good was a, was a, I mean, if, if you look at that woman, I kind of called her, she made $200 an hour, so every 15 minutes was costing her, well, you could work it out, yes. you know, $66. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think that it was not just a matter of we, we hit the home run on every level from fashion style, fit, uh, lifestyle, and everything else, but, but subconsciously, I was always thinking about what drove that woman, and I think time, looking good, wanting to get married, wanting to have children, I think these are fundamental to our to who we are as human beings. That's beautiful. And when your marketing was very different, you were going to go compete with Nike and Adidas and people like that, and you had a different approach to marketing. Tell us a little about what your approach was there. Well, I think, I, I think a little bit of the funny story behind that is uh, when we were out of, basically out of money, but we knew we had something phenomenal. We only had 12 employees, and uh, I, I sat them down, and I, this is our first kind of company meeting, and I said, look at Nike's our competitor, and if we do what we're doing here, we're going to pass them by 2030. And so, so that's, that quite, was, a, that's I, quite a vision for a brand new company. Come in for that. I love that. But we had amazing people, amazing people who kind of did it on their own. Now I've forgotten the question. <laughs> How did you market differently? Because oh, yeah, you, yeah. you didn't go head to head with them in the traditional way. You built relationships. You worked with key influencers, as I understand. Tell us a little bit about the marketing. Well, I can't say enough about uh, working from no money. I'd say almost everything I learned was really out of West Beach and having 18 years of not making any money. So I had to figure out how to do everything differently. And, you know, I, of course, probably the big one is inventing vertical retailing. But, the, but at the point, you know, you got, you're in surf skate snowboarding and these other companies are spending a million dollars for a snowboarder, you know, because they need to sell the clothing in Japan. And that's, they're very influenced that way. But I went, wow, I have like... $30,000, what am I going to do? So I, I, I figured out I could go to, in snow, let's just call it snowboarding, I could go to a mountain and I could pick out the top three people who couldn't be sponsored. They weren't good enough to sponsor, but everyone in the community loved them. Mm. And so I would give them clothing, but I wouldn't sponsor them. I'd go, you're now a tester. Like your whole thing is tell me everything you can about this product, where the world is going, how snowboarding is changing, what needs to happen, and then bring it back to me. And so when I got into to yoga, you know, I, after I paid taxes on my million dollars, I'm down to $750,000. I got, I got to buy these three Japanese flat lock machines so I don't have that, you know, this thing inside yeah. of the seam. I had to... Um, buy maybe two, two three hundred thousand dollars of fabric because you've got to buy economy of scale and that end of things. I had to hire two employees. There's another hundred thousand. I'm left with one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Let's yes. call it that. Yeah. So I go well. Now I've got to open up a store because I'm in vertical. I got to open a store. I can't do it on the main street because I can't afford it. So it's got to be the second story. Okay. Well, if that's what I am, second story, and people have to find me through the back alley, what can I do? So. It came then to, like, um, I had the clothing store, so we'll, well, we'll have yoga classes in our room. So we, we had everything on wheels. We'd put it to the side. We'd crank the temperature up to 110, <laughs> and we'd, uh, we'd have yoga classes. And then the woman would... Oh, that created her, the foot traffic. Yeah, there. yeah. So it was kind of like a, a... And we gave the space to the yoga teachers, so they made money. The, the, the price was lower for the... For the um, yoga people doing yoga because they didn't have to pay for the overhead of a yoga studio and and we got exposure to our product wow and you have these local heroes basically that right. were wearing your clothing obviously and people being role models to people for that experience that's amazing what what what, what did you learn i think if i'm correct you had made a mistake i think when your snowboarding days and i think you talked about there were you made these baggy pants of some sort and they didn't sell for squat and it, it really taught you a lesson that affected you later, if I remember correctly. <laughs> well, it was actually the opposite. Oh, it was the opposite. Yeah, yeah. So thanks. For, I know you know you're trying, but it, it <laughs> 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 that didn't come out very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife is very used to things not coming out of. <laughs> anyway, no, I um, 
I, 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 I had an ego around me. I was 32 years old. I, was des I designed a line of snowboard clothing for these 14 to 18 year old boys. I showed them the line and they went, no. And I went, what do you mean, no? And I, of course, I was, at that time in my life, I knew subconsciously I was trying to manipulate them. Like, you love, yeah, here I'm showing it to you. you. You love it. You go out and tell other people about it. It'll all work out perfectly. And then I went, well, well, why not? And what do you want? He said, we want clothing that, like, is this big. And they call it fat clothing and big hoodies. And, and of course, I'm 32 years old. I have no idea that kind of rap and hip-hop is coming down the pipe. And I have no idea why it's designed that way, because it doesn't make any sense for me. It's not how athletic clothing is built. And so we, we built that clothing. What was, and what was great about it is, because it, it wasn't tight, I didn't have to have stretch clothing, and I could, it could, you could you know, tighten it up, but you could have air underneath. It actually worked quite well from a technical point of view. But that because we came out with a line that was so different than everyone else in the world, that we kind of took we you know we we kind of took the whole snowboard business away. So so they rejected you. It wasn't the line. You changed the line and you made it successful. Yeah, but here's my mistake. And as I learned is the next year I went to them again with you know this big bag of clothes. They went no 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 no. Now we want it like slim down. We don't, <laughs> we want a little logo. And I went fashion. Oh, you're crazy. I got another year of this for sure. <laughs> And uh, so, anyway, I made a mistake, and it, and it taught me when I got into snowboarding, I had to have, like, 10 women of 10 groups, and I had to talk to them all the time. Like, tell me, tell me, tell me. I know nothing. Constant feedback from the customer. Yeah. And that's where our community and all that really came from. Well, you know, uh, I, I read that, you know, I don't know if it's accurate, but in the first five years of Lululemon, you grew to 3 billion, is that correct? 3 billion? Yeah. I would have liked that. No, maybe 3 million. Three million in the first yeah. five years of Lululemon? Yeah, 98 to, yeah, I'd say, th no, maybe like 10 million. Oh, 10 million. Yeah. Wow. That yeah. Okay. So during that time, you must have had some challenging times. I love hearing from entrepreneurs. What, what are one or two of the more challenging times you face where maybe it was really, really concerning and how'd you turn it around? Well, I did. I ran out of money multiple times. Mm. And, um, and, you know, <laughs> and finally, I... Because I had to make, I was so keen on economy of scale from being an economist at university that I figured the only way I could do that was to have only black fabric, and then I'd make 2,000 pieces of everything. So I went and made five styles, 2,000 pieces, owned up in my store, and then, you know, six people would walk in a day. So I could cover the overhead because right. I'm, not only did I didn't have vertical retailing, but I actually owned my own manufacturing too, so I... It had two markups nobody else in the world had, and that was manufacturing and wholesale. Mm. Um, where was I again? Holy smokes. I was talking about the challenge, the most challenging. Yeah, yeah. So, so, we ran, so after about eight months, we, we ran out of money, and I went, well, I got, I got about 90 days left, so what am I going to do? So I did the very thing I hated to do more than anything, and I wholesaled. There was an account that wanted a whole bunch. I could give them like $30,000 worth. I knew that if I did that and I got the money in, it was going to, you know, they say they're going to pay in 60 wholesalers, or they say they're going to pay in 30 wholesalers, pay in 60. Um, and, and I said, with that, then I know I can kind of get over the hump. No, they went bankrupt. Woke up one morning. So you didn't and, get anything. And it was, that was my very, very last resort for money. And so then, like an entrepreneur, you're going to go, well, what's my very, very, very last resort? And, um, and at Vancouver at the time in 99, um, Hong Kong had just changed over to China. Hong Kong's a lot like Vancouver. They all moved to Vancouver. Housing prices went up 25%. I went and borrowed for my third time on my house because I could do it. And then, and then we got through another like uh, seven months and then I couldn't make payroll in about another week. And, uh, but I... In desperation, I'd gone back and worked for my old company, West Beach, that moved from Salem or Portland to back to Vancouver, and uh, they fired me. And, uh, <laughs> because they, they were combining sim skateboards with West Beach snowboards, and they took that CEO, and they gave me $57,000 to leave, and it was a godsend for Lou Lemon. And it was just before Christmas. We opened up a new store on the street. My 
My wife was basically the CEO at that time, and we, she, you know, we just took it, and it, and from that moment on, it was a rocket ship. Wow. How, when did you know, I was asking this question for each of you, when did you know this business was really going to take off then? How many years into Lululemon before you knew you really had it? And how did Be- you know? Because moving from technical in the studio and onto the street, I knew was the, was the big part of it. I would say, let's see, my, I'd say it's 2002 in the summertime. My wife and I were walking down the street. I married her, very smart. That didn't let any competition kind of get Good in. Good move. Anyway. I, I know. <laughs> Corner designing for your competition. <laughs> but we were walking down the street, and we were like both like this, and we saw a girl walking towards us in tights. And because we'd solved this problem, or you know, with this diamond gusset in the crotch, a girl could now wear a pair of tights out on the street. And so she kind of walked by, and we kind of looked at each other, and then we turned around to look because we. We decided we never wanted the, anyone to look in a mirror and see the logo on the front. We always wanted our logos on the back. And in athletics, they let you allow to have logos on them. So we had this, we turned around like this and then we went, and went, oh my God, that's our type. T- and of course, the girl turned around at the same time. <laughs> and I don't know what she was thinking. <laughs> but at that moment, we both knew that we had exactly what we wanted. Wow. As you, you, you talked about, yeah, give me half of that's amazing. You know, Berlin's essay on the fox versus the hedgehog kind of was a related mentioned earlier. Yeah. I know that's one that's very familiar as well. The fox has a million ways, it knows a million things, right? The hedgehog won. Tell us how that philosophy helped to shape you. I can't, I can't say enough about the hedgehog, what you're best in the world at, what you're passionate about, what your economic engine is. So we decided we were going to be best in the world at black lycra tights. Mm. And when you decide you're going to be best in the world at something, you can't just be for that, end up being on that one product because it pervades throughout the whole business. So your logistics have to be best, your manufacturing has to be best, your delivery has to be, marketing has to be best in order to not let any competition slightly move into that market. Mm. Um, We were passionate about athletics. And uh, our economic engine was, I think today is still unbeatable. That big ball is still rolling down the hill. And that is, um, uh, you know, we don't have a middleman. And we, you know, unfortunately the board kind of moved the manufacturing to the side, which I think was one of the biggest mistakes ever. But we still, nobody's been able to replicate the muscle of this vertical retailing model, which costs so much money to get into. You built a manifesto that, if I understood what I read, you said was the main reason why someone would work at Lululemon and stay at Lululemon. Can you share with us just a little bit about what that manifesto was about and what those values were? There's this packaging, and it's like virtually free. You're already making it, and you're already printing it. Why don't you do something with it? Yes. So, um, um, So what people don't know is we had probably about 80 sayings on the outside of the bag. And, you know, friends are more important than money, um, live in the moment, um, you know, sweat so that you can, you know, there, there was, I, the more I think about it, the more I forget all the ones that are in it. But it, um, I really got it from, my dad was one of those original hippies at the, in Est in, you know, Big Sur, California and living on, you know, the, the what was that ranch down there just south of I know what you're talking about yeah uh, Del Mar or, yeah anyway anyway so he was an original hippie and always kind of looking for the meaning of life and never wanting to find it because if he found it then he would have no meaning <laughs> you know type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got a lot of that you know like that kind of Steve Jobs you know like a commune eating self development and. I was 18 years old when my dad came home from the from Est and said, you know, Chip, I think the meaning of life is living in the moment. I mean, I got, I got the craziest dad in the world and, you know, I just wanted nothing to do with any of that. And, of course, we all turn into our parents, you know, and that's... Right. <laughs> turn into our parents. <laughs> it's like that commercial they say with, with the insurance company, we can't keep you from becoming your parents. Tell me, um, when, when you look at the growth of the business... There's a point in which you decided to sell 50% of the business. Right. 
Why did you decide to do that at that point, if you would? And then later on, you sold uh, just a small percentage of the business for about tenfold of what you did the first time. Tell us why you made the first decision at that time, and then a little bit about the second one. Well, I was I was an older entrepreneur, so you know I was, you know maybe fifty two when I had when my wife and I started having children. We so we had three within two years. We had tw- twins. So oh wow. You know, and I, and I had two older children from my first marriage, and I went, you know, like, this is all that's important now is my family and my children. And um, so I thought maybe the company's worth $25 million, and my CFO and GM went out and told me that it was worth $225 million. I went, how many that's years, a, How many years into it was this? Um, that was probably 2006, so maybe eight years into it. Eight years into it. And, um, I, I mean, uh, we, uh, we didn't, my, my wife and I, you know, we both came from very, we didn't even know how to, we'd only go to the store to buy one tube of toothpaste. Two would be like a big stretch for us, you know? So, um, oh God, now I forgot. So, what but, you're, but I want people to get 25 <laughs> years into your entrepreneurial yeah. career before you really got to see a reward and you sold yeah. half of it for what, 90 yeah. million or something like that? Yeah, I sold for, yeah, yeah, let's call it 100 million. And uh, it was about family, but it was also about, uh, you know, I, I, it was already an international business and I knew I couldn't be on the plane and, you know, Dan can do it his, after his, probably his kids grew up, but I couldn't do it while my kids were young. And yeah. so I went, well, if I'm going to prioritize family, uh, then that's number one. And two, I was really looking for expertise in how to go into the U.S. and win it. And I wanted to know, you know, retail locations. I wanted to understand that, that realm of things. Um, and so, yeah, so we sold for $100 million And it wasn't the right move. If I had to kind of go back to it, Lou Lemon was a cash cow. We were making so much money because I was missing these two middlemen that I could have just taken a loan unencumbered from the bank for $40 million and yeah. be the happiest guy in the world. Yeah. If I had to do it in, in, in retrospect, I would have stayed the CEO, but I would have got a rock star of a COO mm. to manage it so that I could control the culture, the self Because it really the self-development part of our business. We weren't in the apparel business. We were in the people development business. Yes. And what, tell us about the values that you really tried to include, not just on the packaging and yeah. so forth, but within the culture with, with the people that worked with you. What were the most important values you tried to engender and how did you do it? How did you build your culture is, I guess, what I'm really asking because we all know culture is really, in the end, what makes a business go or not, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, part of it was in the first three weeks, you had to listen to the good to great, the, highly, the seven habits, the psychology of achievement. You had to do your goals. And then we, because you weren't around at the time, I didn't even know you. We'd started in on the landmark course. Yes. And, and I, what I, and it kind of did, because it came out of the est, I understood like standing in the moment, there's no past, there's no future, and create, you know, from the present. So when I we had people set goals, which is the way we kept the culture going, um, We'd get them. It's really a difference when you're setting a goal from the future, an unknown future, as opposed to a known past. Yes. And they're they're far more expansive. They're far stronger, and it, so it kept our culture, you know, so so strong. And we had them all posted up in the back rooms of the stores and in the office. Everyone knew what each other was doing. Everyone would help each other get to their goals. It was and. It wasn't me. I mean, we had a group of about eight women who came into Lululemon shortly after we started it who just took it and ran with it. Wow. And it really, a lot of that came from the book, The E-Myth, you know, where yes. my job is to, like, develop and train people and get the hell out of the way. And that worked incredibly well until we started getting probably the, you know, the financial people in. And I think Dan was talking about that again. It's a killer of every company. And you know, I'd say Lululemon would be double, you know, would, would have passed, easily passed Nike if it wasn't for that. And you're, uh, so you at one point brought in the CEO, I think it was of Starbucks who took yeah. over, right? And then gradually you became unhappy with the direction things were going as you stopped having some responsibilities in the company, it sounds like. 
And so tell me a little bit about what happened in that area, because then later on you sold, I think, 14% of the business, yeah. a little more than that, for almost $850 million. It's a pretty huge jump. And then you eventually not only left the company, but you, you, you put out a public letter about your unhappiness that the company was no longer aligned with those values. So tell us a little bit about those stages in the business for you. Well, I think it's like Dan says, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this um, book, this book I'm just reading right now about Boeing and how it was engineering driven and it was a family and they everything was about safety it was all about the passenger and then you, when you have a company that starts to be run by accountants and financial people in wall street then it becomes about everything but that yeah, yeah. <coughs> it's true and so and so you, what happens on a board of directors is you end up with nine people because you needed to run the three different committees. Those people are generally not creative people. Creative people can't stand being in a board of directors. Yeah. And so, so if eventually it ends up with me and eight financial Wall Street people who are trying to deliver value for shareholders. Yes, good job. You can do that for three years. But more and short then, term, and yeah. So... Yeah. so um, it, it was palpable in, in the board meetings. It was just, it was me like going, I, like somebody's got to stand for the employees. Somebody's got to stand for the quality of the product. Nobody in here cares about it. And I think you should all fire yourselves. And they fired me. <laughs> and how big was the company at that time? What were sales at that point? Revenues? Oh, um, billions, billion and a half. Billion and a half. Yeah. What are they today, by the way? I think five, six, seven billion. Yeah. So you retracted yourself. You you put out the public letter, and what and you what 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 happened to your own psychology? Did you say I'm just done with this? Did were you frustrated, pissed off? Did you say I'm just going to go create something new? It's a different stage of life. How did you look at things at that stage? Because what a journey. Well, I don't know if you've ever had the love of your life leave you. <laughs> you know, like it's devastating. You know, and. My whole, everything I was from the very poor of my body was Lou Lemon. Everything about it. So to, it, and I'd like to be, you know, I've listened to you, Tony, I go, and I, you know, others, and I go, put the past behind you. I like, can yes. put it behind you and move forward. But, you know, if that love of your life has left you, it, the, the, the conscious mind to think about only the future and negate the past doesn't occur at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it, I think time has to go by to let that, to let that go. Yes, yes. Um, so. Well, Steve Jobs was taken out of his company and came back later and took it over and built the most successful company yeah. in the history of the world. Would you ever go back to Lululemon? Uh, no, because I don't think, um, I think it took the culture in a different direction. So far like away. Anymore. So it's too tough to probably go into a big company now and change it. But I have bought into uh, Ammer, which owns Atomic Ski, Solomon, Peak Performance, Wilson Balls out of Chicago, and uh, Arcteryx out of Vancouver. And I, and I believe we're, we're in the crux of it now, taking that, that same culture and then putting into these other brands. And of course, then I have big goals of these brands passing, you know, Lou yeah. Lemon. Yeah. Even though I'm the largest shareholder of Lou Lemon, I'm slicing my own throat. But it's, it's the game for me now. <laughs> well, it is. And it's a beautiful game. So you look at your journey from the oil fields yeah. to, you know, 17 years building the first company to Lululemon to changing the industry, changing the world in that area. Uh, you've obviously, you know, done extremely well since then. You've got your own, you know, private equity firms and pieces that you do. You all the things you do with your foundation. <laughs> what? If you have two or three lessons about this journey that you'd want to pass on, what are two or three of the most important ones to you? Um, put family first. Mm. Um, nothing, nothing at the end of... And then I put... Well, <laughs> I guess, I, and I know family doesn't mean anything unless you have your health. So, I mean, I'm kind of reiterating Dan. I kind of go, oh, no, no, i got to put my health before family. Yes. And it's true, I think. You actually have to th put your health yep. first to enjoy your family. So... True. Yeah, that's, that would be really important. Um, I'd say, I'd say s surround yourself with great people. Delegate, train, develop, let people go. But you better dang well have some controls so that 
those people can report into you and they have parameters so they can't go beyond yes. and, and wreck the culture or wreck yeah. their business. Beautiful. What you built, you have to be, I know it's been a wild up and down journey as most have, but you have to be incredibly proud of what you and your wife have built together. It's extraordinary. People all over the world light up when you say Lululemon. <laughs> and that started from your vision. Give it a hand for them, it's unbelievable. Let them hear you. Uh, thank you. Let's sit down together and let's take a few questions from around the world, if that's okay, between the three of you. So you can ask questions for any one of the three. Uh, and let's do it. Some people at home, get your hands up and we'll select some there. Let's start in the room right here. Yes, sir. First of all, thank all three of you and Tony for having brought such amazing people. I think we will all learn so much. Thank you. <laughs> this question is for... For Gail, um, I'm in the ice cream business, manufacturing with my brother, who's here as well. And I'd like to ask you, Gail, um, who did you consider or who was the hire you made that when you hired that person, you were like, this is it, we're going forward? Uh, what a great question. Uh, I would say in the food business, one of the key hires, um, I think for me, was our chief operating officer, who basically oversaw all the operations of the company in, as it related to manufacturing. And, you know, when you create products, when you create new flavors, when you develop innovations, that is that is the heartbeat of the company. That is, that is what you are showing to the world who you are. The boxes, it's such a great point, absolutely. But the products also speak about who you are. So to me, that role is so important and it's really important to have someone that has um, incredible um, uh, operational experience in order to make, bring those products to life. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go for another question. Let's take somebody at home. We have somebody from home who's got their hand up. I am a fresh entrepreneur in real estate markets. Uh, I have always taught uh, innovations, so many projects, and I struggle with uh, choosing uh, among these projects. Uh, do you guys have any suggestions um, about uh, how can I proceed with choosing? What you're going to innovate about when you have several choices. Okay, that's a, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Who'd like to take it? Yeah. Uh, I would respond this way. that I think innovation is really about uh, fresh ideas that are applied toward a, a, a new solution. And, and by that I mean look for a broad range of possibilities. When you think about food service, this is, is an example, or a recipe. Um, you know, great chefs, there's no new ingredients. It's really just about a fresh combination. And so when we think about innovation, it's really a fresh combination of really some, maybe some very principled ideas that have been around for a long time, but you've come up with a, res a unique recipe combination of some things that are applied toward a, a, a marketplace problem that, that creates a remarkable solution. Uh, I think we have to do a lot of incubation, a lot of measurement. You've got to have something that's going to really be uh, uh, welcomed uh, by the marketplace, but continue to prototype, 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 test, 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 begin to incubate it out, and never try, here's the big thing, never try to scale an idea that's bad DNA. If there's any bad DNA, you want to know it before you start scaling it. Because once you start scaling it, if there's some bad DNA in it, you got a train wreck. It's just going to be a matter of time. It hurts your brand. Well, yeah, exactly true. Right. Good feedback. Yeah. Uh, anything you'd like to address? It? Um, the only thing that I would add, I think that's spot on. The only thing that I would add is data and research. You really need to take a look at the market. Now, obviously, having your own data is very expensive. But there's so many resources out there now that you could get... <clears throat> really inexpensive research into the market, talk to consumers, what's missing? What can you do better or easier or cheaper or more efficiently? So I would say 
I always say most of the uh, answers to, to entrepreneurs' questions are data, data, data. How about for you? Okay. I mean, those, those are two great answers. Uh, I only have to add that, you know, what, what would you, what part or what business would you go into that you would think about 18, 20 hours a day for fun? And I think it comes back to Dan, what are you, what are you meant to be doing? Because I think if, you're, if you can find that out in one of those innovations, then life will become very easy and your subconscious will come up with a lot of, a lot of the answers. It's beautiful answers. I'd add just one other piece, which is, what does the customer care most about? What is their biggest pain? What is their biggest desire? Not yours, because I think the biggest mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make is they fall in love with the product or service they want. Agreed. They don't really fall in love with the product or service that their ideal client wants. So you've got a list of things to consider, and you might tackle them all. You might test them all. But if you're looking for priority, which you have to rigorously do because you only have so much time, cash, capability, and energy, it's to say, where is the greatest pain? Where is the greatest desire out of all these pieces? That's where you're going. Even if you're wrong, you can then adjust and you can still meet that need. But I think you've got to know what that need is to guide the innovation. That's what I mean by strategic innovation versus just innovation. You can keep innovating. You know, as many of you here are more artists, some are more manager leaders, as we've described. Some of you are more truly entrepreneurial, meaning taking risks. Everybody's entrepreneurial. But when you're an artist, you tend to really fall in love with what you want. And so very often, you're going to miss what the audience wants. So don't just innovate to innovate. Strategically innovate based on what is really needed and desired. And don't expect that it's going to work the first time, right? I mean, all of us have learned. You just gave the example with the clothing. It's like, okay, I, I want to know when it doesn't work because that points me there. So many people don't make the decision to innovate or do anything because they, they're not certain. And what every great entrepreneur knows is you can't wait till you're absolutely certain because <laughs> it's like investing. If you absolutely know everything about the investment and everything that's possible, the opportunity is gone. When I talk to the greatest investors on earth, that's why I say a lot of smart people are terrible investors because they're winning absolute certainty. Well, that time it's over. <laughs> but what you have to do is take calculated risks and you've got to test, 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 and you just got to adapt, adapt. Because if you keep adapting, you're going to find a way to meet the need. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Give her a hand. Yeah. Thank you so much. Give it up. How about right here? Yes. What's your question? Who's it for? Uh one of my, uh, it's for everyone. One of my limiting beliefs is that um, being an entrepreneur and, and owning a bunch of businesses is, is stressful and um, can be chaotic. And I, this is my question to everyone. Can, can you actually live a peaceful life, uh, an abundant life and have time to spend with your family, owning a bunch of different businesses and always doing a bunch of stuff? Is that actually achievable? Cause my experience has been no. So I just, I need to hear you know, obviously, uh, experienced investors' perspective. Well, I'm going to go first on this. <laughs> I think, you know, I have this line that an entrepreneur is someone too incompetent to work for anyone else. <laughs> so I think that, um, so it almost limits the choice. You have to go into the business. And then I go back to the book, The E-Myth. How, really read it, and how can you set your business and life up so that you've got documented processes, you know, training, development, quality control, everything else, so that you can have some semblance of, of um, normality and you as the entrepreneur can be thinking four or five years into the future. Either of you? Uh, it's such an important question. Um, I wish I had asked it. <laughs> um, so I, I suppose that's kind of a short way of saying... Certainly not initially. That's right. And initially, it, you wake up thinking about it at 4 a.m. and you go to bed thinking about it at midnight. And it is all consuming. It is literally all consuming. And it is hard to think about anything else. I, I would say there's two good parts to that. One, isn't it wonderful to have something that you care about so much? Yes. Yes. That's, I, <laughs> it's a great one. I, I, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I always call Kali Power my third child. And it's, it's wonderful to have another entity to love that much. Mm. Um, and then I'd also say it's not 
always going to be like that. And there are a number of things that you can do to achieve peace. So for me, my kids were young when I started Collie Power, certainly younger. And I really struggled with how to manage that, how to find peace. And what, it, what I did is I really engaged them in the business. They became my taste testers. They became my booth workers. We talked about it at dinner every night. So is it perfect? No. Is it the hardest thing you'll ever do? Yes. Is, can it be a wonderful bonding experience for your family to achieve something so meaningful? Absolutely. Very good. Nice. Uh, yes. I, I would respond uh, maybe from a spiritual standpoint. I mentioned earlier in our conversation about the the uh, embracing inadequacy that we all are going to be faced with inadequacies in our life, in our own view. Maybe we don't live up to expectations of, of family members or business associates or even in the marketplace perhaps or shareholders or, or investors. And we go through a lot of self-doubt, disappointment. Um, but, but at some point we have to embrace that sense of inadequacy. And that's where I feel like we... It's, 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 it's fair game to ask God to, to, for his favor, for his blessings, for his anointing. Uh, I love the story where, you know, the disciples came to Jesus and there's 5,000 people out there. It's a food service opportunity. And uh, how are we going to feed all these people, you know? And, and so they almost jokingly say to Jesus, well, we got two fishes and five loaves of bread. You know, is that going to feed 5,000 people? Well, Jesus said, well, you just step back. Watch what's getting ready to happen. And he performed a miracle. And I think there's a God in heaven that loves us that does want to perform miracles in our life where his favor makes these things just incredibly, unbelievably just kind of take off it. You know, there's a lot of work that was had a personal sacrifice on and on and on. You know, families that are going to have to engage, you know, with us on this, on this journey. But uh, what, what is the man gain or lady? What is the man or woman? What do they gain of the whole world but they lose their own soul? Or, or lose a, a marriage, or, or lose a, 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 an estranged child. And so I think, that for my sake, I've been able to ask God, please give me wisdom. You know, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally. Let's ask God for wisdom. Let's ask for his favor and anointing, and, and watch, see him do miracles in our life. It's beautiful. Hi, Dad. I'd add that, um, you know, sometimes people, I'd ask people when we do these seminars, um, you know, to fill out a form, and one of the questions would be, why, why'd you get into business? I remember sitting in Fiji, and these people are all coming for an event, and this person wrote down, I'm getting into business so I can have more free time. And I thought to myself, <laughs> that's like saying, I'm going to have a child so I can have more free time, right? <laughs> so you don't want to delude yourself, but also you're responding at the early stages. In the early stages, as you heard earlier, at Airbnb, I mean, they couldn't pay his rent. That's how he started, eight years. You know, now Joe himself is worth 5.8 billion. You know, in the early years here, 25 years before we really saw a result here, your father worked for probably more than two decades before he saw it. You're the young chick here at seven years into the process and crushing it, right? So, you know, I remember years ago, I met with a gentleman who started MTV and we had this really cool conversation, but part of what came out of it was he said, you know, it took me seven years. He said, to just get that thing from scratch to where it was a foundation. Yeah, yeah. And he said, you know, Tony, and I was doing that too. I had a lot of small businesses. And he said, Tony, you know, I came in and did a speech for him. He had taken over AOL and, and he just taken before that Century 21. And he wanted me to come speak. And you know, they'd offered me, you know, like $125,000 or some ridiculous fee. And I said, why won't you do it? I said, well, because it's half my fee and I don't have the time anyway. But I said, I'll do it for you for free. I did it for him for free just because he's a good man. I said, because I'd love you to teach me, coach me. I'd love to learn from you in some way. I'm not asking every day. Just, oh, I'll go do this for you, and then let's have a lunch, and you teach me the most important things you learn. And he said, listen, these seven-year cycles, I realize I only have so many of those. Mm -hmm. So, Tony, you came into Century 21, and I don't remember the real number, but you know, he said, I didn't realize you're like a rock star. He, you know, he knew Paul Tudor Jones and Ray Dalio and people that he respected that were fans of mine. But he goes, like these middle America people in their gold jackets, I mean, they worship you, but he goes, more importantly, do you know what happened to our sales? And I don't remember the real number, but they went up, whatever it was, 30% over the next 90 days after that event. He goes, Tony, we've never seen that kind of number change. He said, but you got nothing, and I got a multiple on that. And he said, and here's what I did. I no longer start the companies. 
I go to companies that have momentum and I do what you do. I bring the strategy, I bring the inspiration, I bring the tools, I bring the training, I bring the new vision to it. And then I sell those for a multiple. And so the last 10 years of my life, I went from a lot of small businesses, but I learned like all of us here, over a 20 plus period of time, I made all kinds of mistakes. I tried to learn from other people. I had times when I was near bankruptcy, it looked like. But I, was, I had something to my benefit that all three of these people have. It was my mission. You said doing a lot of businesses and doing a lot of stuff. That's very revealing. That's not what this is. This is a mission. This is a mission for, to honor her father. This is a mission to take care of her children. This is a mission to give people joy and happiness and pleasure. This is a mission to have people feel like they're their best, like not mediocre. This is a mission for people to feel like they're loved and kind and there's a place they know who they are. Mine was a mission, so it didn't matter if I'd made money or not. It was stressful, but I integrated that because it's, there is no work-life balance. Not if you're going to be an entrepreneur. Anybody tells you that's lying. There's work-life integration. Right? I remember talking to Mary Callen Erdos, who's the number two person at JP Morgan, incredible human being, manages $2.7 trillion, trillion with a T. And I asked her about work life balance. She goes, Tony, it's absurd. She goes, I've read your stuff too. You think the same thing. And she goes, I integrate my family. And she said, You know, she, when she was young, she came, like, did you hear some common patterns here? She came to work with her daddy, who was in the financial business. And she sat behind his desk and she saw what was going on and she developed an unconscious vision from all of those things. And that she does that with her children. She brings them into the environment. And I did that with my kids. So I didn't have to give it up, but it was hard, especially when it was on the road. In the beginning, I took my kids with me and I thought, you know, school's great, but an education's more valuable. They're gonna travel the world, meet the most incredible people. But then if you're honest, you see kids need consistency. So I'd bring them home and I'd miss them. So it was hard, but it was worth it. And my kids also got to see what it takes. You know, today they're, they're humans of contribution because we did so much giving besides our work. You know, most of you know, right? I'm closing in on a billion meals right now, 978 million meals just in the last 10 years. So they would go out and do those things with me. They would go out and come to the seminars. So I didn't have that choice between family and this. I had to work my tail off. But then there's a point where you start to understand how to get leverage, where all the knowledge that you've accumulated starts to hit, and that's when the Airbnb goes from eight years to nothing to eight years to 50 billion. That's where I went to, okay, now I have 110 companies. I'm not around managing them all. There's 12 that I'm actively involved with, but I'm strategic in all of them. That's $7 billion in business. I have no business background. I learned it all. But I have a whole lot more time because I'm a business owner. I'm not a business operator, which you currently are and we all start out as. As an operator, you do everything. You don't leverage much because you're the best at it. You don't want anybody else to make the mistake. But then you never grow. And the operators are always stressed. So you're in the early stress stage saying, will it ever be any different? It will not if you don't have a clear mission. It will not if you don't know what you're doing this for beyond the money. And there's nothing wrong with the money. You deserve the money. But it's gotta be more than that, especially in the beginning. There's not enough reward to keep you going and you go, ah, I'm gonna go back to work for somebody else. And there's nothing wrong with working for somebody else. A lot of people, that is gonna give them a better quality of life. It has to be, are you that person that has that bug that says, I have something I wanna bring to the world. If you have that bug, and I wouldn't be focusing on multiple businesses, that's like people that do a terrible job with their first child and then they have three more, right? That's a lot of entrepreneurs do. I'd find the one thing the hedgehog piece, the one thing you're most passionate about, the one thing you can make that difference about. And then I'd say, this is the cost. Uh, this is what I tell people to do. Write down everything you wouldn't want. To, what's something you really want? And then write down everything you might have to do that you don't want to have to do to make that happen. And then look at each one at a time and decide if you're really willing to do it. And if you are, there's something that happens psychologically in your brain. It's like all of a sudden you won't need to do all those things if you just face it. There'll be some you will but there is no free lunch. So there has to be a deeper fuel for you, a deeper meaning, which is a purpose for this business. Otherwise, you'll be one of the many. And one of the many, most people, if they stay in business, half are gone in a year, 80% are gone in five years, 96% are gone in 10 years, 4% make it, that doesn't mean they're profitable. So if you're gonna make it, you need a different fuel. And I would really just, I would pull back and say, what is it that I really love? What is that am I really about? What is it that will give me meaning? And then you'll find you won't be as stressed and you'll learn from the stresses 
And there's a period of time where it'll be a huge pull. And then there's a pull of time where, I don't know if it'd be fair to say, all of us at this stage, without exaggeration, can probably do more with our pinky than it used to take us 24 hours a day because we know so much. We have the relationships, we have the business, we have the principles. So we can do things quicker, faster, more, and it's actually easier. But you got to build to that place. It's like saying, I want to be a doctor, and you're not going to put in the 12 years or 10 years to get to that point, much less the time you're going to operate. So I really call to all of you, it isn't right for everyone to be an entrepreneur. And if it scares you, don't do it. Don't do it. But if it scares you and you're hungry for something more, then you'll have no choice but to do it. Find your purpose. Give me a hand. Thank you so much. How about, how about in the gray sweatshirt there? Give me a hand. Uh, I've recently taken over a company in August that I really loved the mission. And uh, I was an early investor, and that company is called Kinergy. Um, it's a dance movement app. And we've been blessed to start the turnaround. We've launched an app. We have great culture, raving fans. But to really to chip and, and the whole thing, how do we now scale and grow? What can I be thinking about? I, I almost going to pass on it. I, I, I feel like at a digital end, I'm not that... I'm not that sure, but I, I do know that if it sounds like you have a market that's very passionate about what you're doing, and I think it's not that difficult to reach them on a digital level to find that who, who they are, and then uh, and I guess it's kind of going back to the 2000s, how do you almost give your product away for free until you have economy of scale and then start putting a price structure on it. But I, I, I think I'm the worst person in the world to talk about this. So we, I'm babbling. I don't even want to do it. <laughs> Any thoughts? Uh, I like scale. Uh, uh, my dad was the entrepreneur. Uh, we were talking earlier that once he got to the first 100, 200 restaurants, it became almost too complicated for him. He, he, uh, he didn't know everyone as well as he, as he did at one time. And uh, I'm, I became kind of the builder, explorer. Uh, to, I, love just this, I love scaling things. I love growing them. But as I mentioned earlier, I think it's really, really important to make sure you got good DNA before you start scaling something. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we, we just put together some staff for Asia that's down in Singapore. We've got seven people on our payroll right now. I can't tell you how much time we spent with each one of those individuals because if we don't have the DNA right, in Singapore, and we start scaling something that doesn't reflect our culture, yep. doesn't reflect our values, yep. doesn't reflect our principles and own and unknown, then we got some bad DNA. So uh, just my overall word to you is make sure you got really great DNA before you start scaling it. That's really good. Good. Anything else? Uh, I was just looking at the screen here, and you have some great consumer love for Kinergy. Yes, we do. Isn't, isn't that fantastic? So how are you going to wrangle that? How are you going to market that? How are you going to, you know, tell your story? What is this? What, you know, people today, particularly when it's something so personal, whether it's food or how our health or how we engage or how we work out, they want to understand what your brand stands for. What does it stand for? It sounds like you have a great story to tell. So I think a lot of, I think your, your advice was spot on. But I also think taking a minute and figure out, figuring out how you're going to articulate what you stand for as you, is a really important step to do even before you scale. Thank you. I think I'd add one last thing, which is, if you're looking to scale something, if you know the values and you have something of that nature, now it's about getting people, to, a larger number of people to have the experience. So, you know, you, you, you coordinate with, and I try to help you guys with this, coordinate with Oprah so that when she did her concert or her, her event, boom, all these women get exposed to it and they do the exercise. To me, it's like, how do you create an associated market? Who owns the market I already, the one I want? Who owns that market? Mm -hmm. Who I could associate with? Who I could add value to them? And in adding value, I get a mass audience. You know, most of you know that these last three years I've been doing this event since COVID started. 
And it's like, I really want to help people stuck in their homes. And I thought, what keeps people from doing this stuff? Well, travel and money. Well, they don't have to travel. They don't have money. Let's do it in their home. And now we'll have, this will be the third year. We have a million people for five days. And a million people having that experience of transformation is so huge. And there's no better marketing because now the word of mouth of that goes literally around the world. So I'd be looking to see, once you've got your act together, how do I get myself in environments that get enough experience? Because the experience of your beats is it. The experience once you go to Chick-fil-A. The experience of putting on that clothing and the way you feel. Though People are really going to be moved by the experience, not just the concept. And I do my best to give the experience for free multiple ways and times to build that audience and then make sure you've got a model that obviously you can monetize in an effective way and scale in an effective way. Give me a hand. Thank you. Last, last two questions we'll do here. I'm gonna, I'd like, for the last two questions, I'd like to see if you guys have a question for e e each other, because you're all brilliant in your own right. <laughs> and so it'd be wonderful to see what you might pull from each other if you have one. If you don't, it's no problem whatsoever. But is there a question e any of you have for each other? Um, I guess my question would be to, to, to both of them who have such great wisdom. Um, did you ever feel like giving up? Mm, good question. Feel what? Did you ever feel like giving up? Did you ever oh. think, I just, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm done. Not for me. I, I, again, no. I would have done it for no money. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I didn't, have, didn't feel like giving up on, on, with Chick-fil-A, but I've had some other entrepreneurial things that I've done that I, that I did have to come to a point that I had to give up. Uh, a a Chick-fil-A example is we opened three Chick-fil-A restaurants in South Africa and uh, between 1996 and 2001, three of them, one in Durban, two in Johannesburg. And this is, the, as the country's song goes, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Yes. And we had some, we had some restaurant metrics that, that were not working. Uh, the food cost is okay. The labor cost is really good in South Africa, but we didn't have the sales volume we needed. And to open up 20 more restaurants where the, the financial yeah. metrics did not work was going to be a bad decision. Uh, and so that's, that's we had to co close all three of those restaurants. Yeah. Another entrepreneurial deal I got involved with was a business called Kefi. It was a children's playtainment business. I opened up a, a location in Buckhead, and we we worked on incubating it for about two years. We finally opened it, and we're open for about eighteen months before we had to close it. So. You got to be willing. There's such a thing as Henry Cloud says. There's a, such a thing as necessary endings, and so sometimes we do have to tuck our tail, yes. acknowledge that this is not working, yes. and we have a failure. But I tell you what, the only redemption you have is knowing one day I'm going to reckon. I'm going to. I'm going to win back my self-esteem by learning so much that when we do expand Chick-fil-A internationally, we're going to make sure it's a winner. And <laughs> so awesome. you, you can be vindicated even if you've had a failure. That's wonderful. Do you have a question, Fred? Well, I know I'm, I'm a G1. I know you're a G1. I was going to call you a G2, but you're like a 1.2. Uh, I'm, I'm G2. I'm G2. You got in there so young. Gen we're talking about Generation 2 when we yeah, say that. Yeah. And... Um, and I'm wondering if you kind of like look back at your life, Dan, and you went, you know, if you would have been a G2, uh, your parents had already built out the company, you'd had some wealth in your family and everything there as your G3 is now and is coming in, would you be the same person you are? Did you need to go through all that when you were 9, 10, 11 yeah. to be the person you are yeah. to have Chick-fil-A be what it is? Well, as, as parents, we know that we have to teach some life principles. Uh, we have to let children struggle. We have to deal, let them deal. That's the only way they can muscle up is it, to deal with the weight, the struggle, the responsibilities, and let them deal with the consequences of choices and decisions that they're making. That's the only way we're going to curate wisdom, uh, you know, in, our, in the next generation. And that is the long play. I love what John Maxwell says, that, that success is about succession. I'd say for all of us here, everyone that's listening to this, from day one, we have to start, what's the second act? Who's going to be my successor? Who am I grooming? Who am I mentoring? Who is picking up on this vocabulary, institutional knowledge all along the way? 
because it's so tragic, and we often see this, in entrepreneurs and family businesses, they built this incredible thing, but there were no, there were no successors that could continue it on. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just encourage everybody to, to really pour into that next generation, pay it forward, yes. let people ride it with you, yes. and that way it can go on for a long time. That's awesome, that's, that's beautiful. Great theme. Last question. First of all, I also just want to thank all three of you for so much time. We went way over on time, but you were so interesting and we went so deep. So first of all, thank you. Really, really appreciate you sharing our wisdom with all of us here. It's been fantastic. Our last question uh, is, you can pick one of two or three. (laughs) I'll give you multiple choice. Uh, What's next for you? Could be a question, like what's there. Or what are you most grateful for or proud of about the journey so far? And or a third question, what's the best business advice that was ever given to you? A piece of advice that was invaluable that still you'd pass on today. So I'll, I'll jump into that. I think I had I sat down with a with a uh, a lady that's a real estate attorney, Jenny Pruitt. Uh, she's kind of the Mary Kay of Atlanta market. Uh, she's a big real estate. I was sitting at the varsity with her, and she's getting ready to come up on her birthday. She wouldn't tell me which birthday it was, but it was a a big one. And I love what she said. She says, "As I get older, I'm getting bolder." Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. As, as, and, and so as we get older, we should be getting bolder. I mean, we're, it's about to all be over with. Let's just go for it. Let's, <laughs> That's let's, awesome. Let, let's, let's, let's cash in the chips. Let, let's leverage all these relationships that we built up over time. All the, I got 23,000 people in my, in my sitting in my hip pocket over here on my iPhone. I got all these contacts, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cash it all in, and I'm going to go for it. And so yeah. I'm doing the biggest BHAG stuff I've ever done in my life That's alongside cool. Chick-fil-A. I've gotten the studio business now and operate the largest soundstage operation in North America. Wow. We've got 23 stages. We've got eight more that are under construction. Uh, we're the home of all the big Marvel stuff that's going on now and Disney streaming shows that are going on. And then my next big deal that I've got is I'm building a park over the downtown connector, over 14 lanes of traffic in wow. downtown Atlanta, a park over all that traffic in downtown Atlanta. Wow. And then Beautiful. building a remarkable a pavilion on top of it for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra to, to perform. We need more green space. Clyde Warren Park in Dallas, Millennial Park in Chicago, Rose Kennedy Parkway yes. in Boston. If we want to bring a resurgence of vitality in downtown Atlanta, we have to, in, in any downtown area, we have to have green space, much like Central Park uh, in Manhattan, of course. Beautiful. And so it, it, it took my entire life to get to the point that the city of Atlanta the state department of transportation, the federal folks, the private sector would have enough followership, you know, for me to take this thing on. And I say to me, I don't take this from an egotistical standpoint, but sometimes it has to be a somebody with boldness and courage to say, this is my final Shangri-La. I'm going to go for it. Will you join me? And you're all in. And uh, so I'm just going to go out on a flame. So, ah, I know, love it. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> Go out with a flame. Burning bright. That's gorgeous. Yeah. How about for the two of you? Who wants to go next? Well, we're, we're, my wife and our family is in a very fortunate position because, you know, the, I don't know how the tax structure works in the U.S., but every time we sold Lou Lemon to, to go into real estate, we had a big tax bill, and you end up putting a lot of money into a trust, so we've got quite a large trust. And uh, we're behind this goal of uh, turning 30% of... Canada into parkland by 2030. Wow. And wow. The federal, the federal government's behind it. The provin- our provincial government, BC, and our, our province of BC makes Texas look small. So just so you know the size of it, but only 3% of it is inhabitable. So we can buy with like $1 million of our, um, let's, no, what was it again? 1 million acres for $4 million. That's how, that's how, it's so rugged, it's unlivable, but wow. we can now buy these mining and forestry rights from the government, turn it over to the First Nations, and they will run it. Wow. And uh, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. That's gorgeous. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
But you also have donated, if I'm correct, $100 million to help with muscular dystrophy, that type of thing as well, right? To solve this issue. That's correct. And uh, I have another. I'm, I also got $30 million to the $101 million age reversal prize that Peter Diamandis wow, has. Wow, that's so exciting. We're, that's we're, beautiful. I know we're connected that way. Yes, we are. Yeah. Yes, Amazing. that's beautiful. Yeah. How about for yourself? Well, I'm still in, the, in my journey, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm not going anywhere. Uh, uh, I, I think what I'm most proud of um, is the fact that since the very first pizza we sold back in 2017, we've given a percentage of our sales to help build teaching gardens in underserved schools oh, across the country. And beautiful. I love that because, you know, we're really trying to create a world where kids are eating healthier and feeling better and they can that's how you contribute to society. So that's probably what I'm most proud of. And I, I think the best advice I ever gave was when I um, made the decision to start Kali Power. And I was I was very nervous, um, but I knew it was it was almost like a calling. And someone said to me something that that is is so true and I, I'll leave it with everyone today in case it's helpful and that is well she said it's better to say oops than what if <laughs> That's and awesome. it was great advice great <laughs> advice and so whatever you do in life in business um it is about taking risks it's about taking calculated risks but you owe yourself a life with no regrets I, I give a hand for that. It's absolutely beautiful. Very good. Well, this has been uh, beyond what we could have possibly imagined. All three of you are extraordinary souls, extraordinary human beings, besides being extraordinary business people. And um, thank you is not strong enough words, but I hope you feel our deep appreciation for your example and for your love and for your vulnerability and for all that you've built and all that you pushed through to show people what's possible. Blessings to all of you, and thank you for being here. Let's hear it from them from around the world, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for all of them. Let them hear you.